Welcome to Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. A world where coming in second place is not an option, but where principle-centered winning is the only approach. Good morning and welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. I'm Hilary Fordwich of Key Solutions. As you all know, there is no more dynamic and fluid area within the government contracting industry than cybersecurity. And there are few areas of greater importance to our country's future. That's why we are dedicating today's episode to the subject of cybersecurity. Our first guest this morning is Gigi Shum, Vice President and General Manager for the public sector of Symantec. Let's watch and learn from Gigi. I'm delighted to have with me Gigi Shum this morning, and she's the Vice President and General Manager of the Public Sector at Symantec. Good morning, Gigi. Good morning. Yeah, thank you for coming in. Oh, no problem. It's my pleasure. Good, and you've got a quite extensive background uh, in this arena, and particularly some years at FCA, et etc. Can you share with our audience some of your background and what you're doing at Symantec today? Sure. I've been at Symantec for quite a while, the last 15 years exactly and uh, came from a, an acquisition that they did back in 2000 of a small security company called Accent Technology. But I've been in IT for quite a while, probably 30 years or more. Mm -hmm. and, right um, out of kindergarten. Right yes, out of kindergarten. Yeah. And uh, have had the pleasure of working for some very large IT companies to include Sun Microsystems and Oracle, Next Software, and then like I said, for the last 15 years at Symantec. Yeah, and Symantec, tell us, a lot, members of our audience probably always think about you, when you, think of the, you think of the big packets of Symantec and you think about some of more of those software. What are you doing, because you've got an extensive public sector and you're doing far more than most people know about. Yes, exactly. So when most people hear Symantec, uh, when I'm sitting on an airplane and I tell somebody I work for Symantec, I always say Norton Antivirus yeah. because that's the brand the that... The Norton Antivirus software that everybody remembers in those yellow boxes from years ago. Exactly, yes. and that's the brand that everybody knows, that's our consumer brand. But actually, we make uh, a whole uh, array of software. And the way to think about it is that we help protect and secure, secure and manage people's information and identities. So everything from the antivirus software that you might know us for um, to um, uh, software that helps protect identities online, to backup software archiving, um, software that keeps your data highly available, software that helps prevent data loss. So all around the areas of protecting and managing data and identities. Which is very critical in this day and age. I mean, you couldn't almost be in a better space. Yeah, yeah we, we are lucky in that um, the, the space that we're in is one that's really important to our customers, right particularly our, our public sector yeah, customers. Yeah, right place, right time, right? Exactly. Yes. Yes. So I'm here with Gigi Shum from Symantec, and what's interesting about her role, and maybe for our audience, all of you watching, is that Symantec is providing their software to government contractors across the board, not so much contracting directly with the government. So you have a, a very good panoramic view of what's actually happening in the government contracting community today. Yeah, I think that we do. We very, very seldom prime our own contracts. We often work with partners, and those can be large system integrators, but they can also be small VARs, um, 8A firms, so a, a wide array of different government contractors that we work with. So you have your finger on the pulse probably of what's going on and what they're facing. So I do want to ask you about the current cyber attacks and what people sure. talk about in terms of the, the, the imminent threat, the danger. Some people say we're at war, other people say it's, it, it's much worse than they're making it out, they don't want to scare us. What do you think is the current status of the cyber attacks we're facing? Yeah, it's a great question. Symantec obviously tracks this very closely. And um, the threat landscape, as we call it, continues to evolve. But the danger is very real out there. It's a very, very active uh, cyber threat environment. And it continually changes. And so uh, for us and for the government to stay one step ahead of the bad guys, it's very challenging. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there seems to be an immense amount of bad guys all over the world, and it's not just for our technology. A lot of people think it's just for our technology. It's across the board, though, in every vertical and matrix from countries as well. Absolutely, absolutely. There are all different kinds of hackers. We used to think years ago of the prototypical, maybe teenager in the back room who was hacking for notoriety's sake, but today you've got hacktivists, 
uh, you've got organized crime, you've got nation states, and then you still have just individuals acting on their own that are hacking for greed to try to steal either information like uh, your credit card numbers or your social security number. Or ATMs or, up in Manhattan. Or ATMs yes. up in down Manhattan or to steal money is where I was going with that. Yes. So, different, you know, hackers of many different flavors um, who are using many different kinds of techniques to try to steal information. So how are you staying ahead? I know obviously you're hiring the best and the brightest, but how else? We do. Well, we use a combination of people, process, and technology. So we do try to hire the best and the brightest. Um, but we also use technology to help us. If I think back to, you know, five or ten years ago, we would wait until we had seen a piece of malware, a virus, on a number of systems, and then we would take that into our labs and analyze it and then create a signature for it, a defense for it. Um, but those days are long gone, right? The, the threats and the attacks are coming too fast and furiously. And so we employ a lot of um, really uh, unique and state-of-the-art techniques, big data techniques. Um, we have a multi-petabyte database of all uh, code that we see out there on the web. Symantec has a huge sensor network, uh, over 200,000 different sensors that are feeding back information, and then we can analyze those in real time. We can actually look at a piece of code and give it a reputation score based on all the different factors that we know about it, where it came from, how old it is, how many other places we've seen it on the web, and we give the users or the programs on your machine uh, a score that you can then say, all right, this is obviously a good piece of software, I'll let it run on my machine, or it gets blocked because we know that it's something So bad. you're taking data and you're doing something with it, analyzing it, and using it basically as a, as a protection versus Absolutely. just this is the information. Yes. Absolutely. Phenomenal. As you're watching today, I wonder if you're concerned about whether it's imminent, yes or no, that we'll ever have another 9-11. Gigi, what do you think? A cyber 9-11. Uh, it's, I think, possible, um, but there are many, many good people that are working hard to prevent that. 9-11 um, was a physical attack, right. and, um, but what we have seen with some cyber attacks like uh, you may have read about Stuxnet a few years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. That was the first, first cyber attack that we saw that was intended to cause physical damage. And there's a lot of discussion after that about our national grid going down. Exactly. And so um, I do think it is possible that we could have a cyber attack that would inflict physical damage. Um, but it's, you know, like I said, there's a lot of people that are working to prevent that. And I think there's a lot better communication between different groups who are all aware of the danger. So Cry crisis prevention, I planning. Think, exactly. Yes. I, think we're, yeah. I think we're smarter about those things than we were then. So that's a physical threat. What about a financial threat? I mean, should we all be concerned individually about our respective bank accounts? After reading, you referred to the ATM uh, issue up and down Manhattan. Should we be concerned of the security of our finances? Well, I don't ever want to advise people to live a paranoid existence, no, right? right? I don't, I don't want people to think that they should take their money out of a bank and put it in a shoebox under their bed, right? <laughs> the I don't house think... catches on fire anyway. Well, <laughs> that's it's right. flooded or a tornado, exactly. right? Yes. Exactly, right? But, um, but I do think that uh, consumers have to be savvy. Um, two out of every three consumers in the last year, uh, in the last several years, has been a victim of a, of a cyber crime. And so there are risks. I think the best thing you can do is be aware of them. Uh, the good news is that the, the banks, the large banks where you have your money, they are very aware. They're very regulated as an industry, and they do employ many of Symantec's technologies and technology of other security companies that help protect. So, you know, think just the, the, the smart things that you think about, right? Uh, choose a good password. First of all, have passwords. Um, choose a good password. One, that's not easily guessed. Don't make it your first you, name, you know, first name number or, one. Or, or right, or, your, <laughs> yeah. or the word password, you know, yes. which we see a lot, or, or, you know, one, two, three, four, five, five. right? Those kind of things. So have a good password. Um, change it periodically. And, um, and, you know, one of the things that we see about uh, people who get infected, whose machines get infected, is it's often because they go to, um, they respond to a phishing attack and they go to a website that's got malware on it. 
Um, so and they don't realize, and they actually download it without even some, without absolutely. knowing. Yes. Absolutely, Un unintentionally, they don't, they can't see the malware. That's exactly. There. Yes. So particularly when you're um, getting emails and responding to emails, try to be um, a savvy consumer and make sure that they are what they they purport to be. So diligent about the source of that information and the source of exactly. the email. Exactly. If you're yes. getting an email from somebody that you don't know, and um, it's telling you to click at some site. Um, be very, very cautious and don't do that. If you're getting an email, most banks will not have you, will not send you an email and then have you go um, click on a site and enter any information like your social security number or, or any um, what we call personally identifiable information. So just be really cautious about, about things like that. Great advice. So are you wondering what the government's inter interested in and what the government's hot topics are? I'm sure our audience is, so Gigi, can you share with our audience, what is the government looking for from the government contractors you're working with? Sure. Well, I think there's a couple of um, big efforts that are going on right now that involve security. The first of those is something called continuous monitoring. And uh, you may have noticed in the FY14 budget, even in the continuing resolution, continuous monitoring was called out as a project and funded yes. uh, separately, which there weren't a lot of those. Most of the cybersecurity ones were, and that was enunciated. Exactly, yes. it was enunciated. And so um, that's really, um, in the simplest terms, a program that's going on in civilian government agencies to make sure that government agencies really do um, understand their systems, their IT infrastructure, and that they've got the right technologies and process in place to make sure that as they are getting information about incoming threats, that their systems are patched and up to date and have the appropriate security technologies to protect themselves. And so that's one that a lot of the government contractors that we work with are very interested in is continuous monitoring. Excellent. Yeah, a, a second one I think would be mobile, mm -hmm. right? Um, government agencies very much are interested in beginning to see how they can potentially adopt something that's called BYOD. Bring, bring your, your own, own device. device. Which has got many risks associated with many it. Many risks. And uh, it's it has great potential cost benefits if they can move to a BYOD model. But of course, they can't just do that willy-nilly, right? Because it does have many risks. And so we're working with some government contractors to help agencies really determine um, how they can safely move to a BYOD model. And of course that leads to tremendous efficiency, so there's many pressures on the government to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you've been very successful at Symantec. Uh, you've worked with many government contractors. What do you see as some of the keys to winning? Key solutions, most of our regular viewers know, uh, is the force behind the show and provides strategy capture proposal services that help contractors win. So we're so interested in, and our audience loves to hear, what do you see are the keys to winning in, for Symantec, which is a bit different than a regular government contractor with the government, but what do you see? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we are going through a, a strategy effort at Symantec, and we do it in a way that's very practical, right? So not a very kind of high-level strategy. But really, I think the, the key is um, understanding your customer, understanding what their big initiatives and what are the big uh, problems and issues that they're dealing with. Look at that and see what is it that you can help them solve better than anybody else? So don't sell to them, go in and find what it is they need and what the solution find must be. Find what it is yes. they need. Think about what you can potentially offer that solves that problem better than anybody else. And it, it may sound simplistic, but it's really about narrowing it down, not trying to be all things to all people, understanding what you bring to the table and how that can help a government customer. And then the other thing I would say is, particularly with regards to security and cybersecurity, it's an ever-changing landscape. Fast moving, Fast very moving, rapid, very rapid, very, yes. very rapid. And so being able to keep up, being able to evolve with the times. You know, there are solutions that were really appropriate five, 10 years ago that just won't work in today's environment. So making sure that you're keeping up, that your technology is keeping up, and your people are keeping up so that you can evolve with the times. Yeah, well, you're certainly right on top of everything I can tell, Gigi. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming in this morning. It's really been a pleasure. Following on Gigi's insightful comments, I'd like now to share with you a three-way conversation I had with Brian Sartin from Verizon 
and Ronald Adams from the US Secret Service. I'm with this morning two gentlemen who bring to us really a very unique perspective in terms of the threats that we're facing today. I have with me Ronald Adams, who's with the Secret Service, and he's a special agent there. Good morning, Ronald. Good morning. Thank you for coming in. And I also have um, Brian Sartin, and he's with Verizon, and he heads up their risk team. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Thank you both for joining us. Um, the special report that Verizon spends a lot of time with each year is the Data Breach Investigations Report. It's very important you spend a lot of time on it. And Brian, I'd love you to share with our audience what is it and why is it very important to Verizon? Well, it's a study about security failures, cyber attacks, particularly those that lead to the theft of information. We study the causal factors behind them. Who's behind the attacks? Who's pulling the strings? Who are they after? What data types they're stealing? But maybe more interestingly, what is it on the part of the victims that ultimately sets the stage for these crimes? And we bring all of the science-driven conclusions back to a recipe that's hopefully intended to help the reader stay out of the headlines as the next victim. And so that's for you, Verizon. How long have you been doing this? This is our sixth year running. Yes, and you have a lot study. of partners that you do this with. We do, yes, yes uh, the Secret Service, for example. But uh, this year, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a group, an uh, international group that gets together uh, governments, intelligence organizations, and of course some of the most cyber capable law enforcement agencies, and that group gives a more holistic picture of the overall cyber threat landscape. Right, and so I would say to you, Ron, so why do you get involved with this and why is this important to you and how beneficial is this for the working of the Secret Service? We, we strive to develop partnerships with the private industry to better the, our investigative skills, to learn from the majority of the cases that we submit as a whole. Once a year, it's good to kind of look back and reflect, see, see what the trends are, see what's changing, what's new, what's different. Right, and so in terms of trends, that's something our audience, I'm sure, really would love to know. What are you seeing? Are things getting better, worse? Are we making progress? Uh, are things getting better or worse? I think the best way to look at it is, is are things becoming more complex? And they are. We have more variability in the types of threats that, uh, that, that, that we see these days, particularly some types of entities, critical infrastructure, for example, government, uh, financial organizations uh, see more different types of criminal motivations today than they ever have in the past. You have financially motivated crimes that still dominate data stolen, but then you have hacktivism, a completely different beast, and now cyber espionage, which made a big appearance in the study Recently, in this past right? year. Yes. And, and you know, the study was really about, all about how do we sort of compare and contrast those and bring back hard conclusions and, and, and things that, that security professionals can really use again to, to prevent these crimes. And certainly it's made more headlines than ever previously uh, in terms of what's going on in, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a, is, is that a trend, a reason that the, there's more sophistication on the part of criminals or is there, are there other reasons for this in addition? Uh, is there more sophistication in some types of attacks? Yeah. Uh, I'd say that you have different levels of criminals in terms of sophistication. We still see a large number of attacks, more than 50 percent in fact, that are opportunistic in nature. They're accidental. It's not necessarily a criminal going after a, a specific victim in as much as they are going after a vulnerability and actually accidentally stumble on a victim that maybe has something of interest data, maybe that's something they could sell lead to fraud. Like a robber stumbling night to night through different houses that's in the neighborhood. That's right. That's yeah. right. Now that, that speaks to the sophistication of the criminal. Now the other, you know, 50 percent is a smaller quantity though. It, those are more targeted types of attacks. They deal with more evolved criminals, much more sophisticated capabilities and they're going after specific kinds of victims and critical infrastructure, uh, excuse me, critical infrastructure falls into that. Of course, that, that because bucket, it's intentional. Yeah. It's saying it's deliberate and it's intentional and it's planned. Exactly. Yes. The DBR is an extensive report that Verizon has been a great part of and there are really some scintillating findings from this year and I would actually ask you, Ron, in terms of the characterization of who the bad guys are. What are their motivations? Why are they doing what they're doing? Well, as the study came out this year, 80% of uh, the criminals are all financially driven, greed, looking to you know, make money. Financial gain. Yes. Yes. And other findings that you've had from it as well. Yeah, absolutely. There, the the other percentage, the, the 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 big story I think in this year's report, uh, in addition to financial crimes, of course, was cyber espionage, specifically state-affiliated cyber espionage. Something we've been looking to understand for such a long time, but then suddenly this year it sort of splashed onto the radar screen and had a major had a very sizable impact. Yeah. Yes. 
And what are you seeing in terms of the, the characterizations and what people can do with this and what government contractors can do with a lot of that information? Uh, well, the information, let me ask you, the information uh, ultimately when it falls into the wrong hands, what, what do the criminals do with yes, it? Yes, yes. Uh, well, uh, if you're talking about espionage, they use it for political, for military gain, for mm -hmm. intelligence gathering purposes, something that gives them a leg up or an advantage. And then the government contractors, of course, were involved with the prevention of that, and there's many in this arena. But uh, what else is Verizon doing in terms of with the study, the partners that you have, why you're involved with it? Uh, well, if, if it was just Verizon's data, we only see a, a very small part of the threat landscape, you know, larger than many of the other commercial type investigation companies, there's no question. But if we release a study and just say these are the cases we work on and these are our findings, it's not representative and it doesn't give very actionable, realistic lessons for, for the reader. So bringing in uh, additional perspectives, especially one as large and as comprehensive as the Secret, Secret Service, Service, it helps us give uh, more relevant, broader conclusions for, for the audience. Yeah. And in terms of all the other, some of the other partners that you have that are involved? Uh, well, there's, uh, there's other law enforcement agencies, uh, mm -hmm. as well as intelligence organizations, uh, ISACs, uh, if you will. And uh, again, the more varying perspective we bring to the table, the more of a, a comprehensive look at the overall threat landscape. Holistic. That's what we're after. Yes. Holistic. Yes. Yes. At Government Contracting Weekly, we aim to provide you with content-rich information every week. We hope that this is a great learning experience for you. And today we're talking about the DBIR report. So if you're interested in finding out about that report, Brian, I'd love to you to sh for you to share with our audience, what, where could they go to get information? What is in it that is actionable? And why would you recommend that, that many of our viewers could actually um, use it? Well, uh, first, what's in it that's actionable? I mean, mm -hmm. We study the threat landscape. We look at uh, the people who are behind it, the tools, the methods, and what have you. We look at the mistakes, the errors and omissions, and, 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 and some of the poor security issues on the part of the victims that, that do ultimately set the stage for these crimes. And, and, you know, our goal here is to bring these in the form of actionable conclusions and takeaways for the reader, but to give them, you know, again, that recipe for success that, that they can use, what's unique and uniquely applies to that type of an organization, you know, as it affects the different readers that we have, what unique recipe can they apply to, to, to counter the threats that are realistic right now today? Now, in terms of getting the study, of course, you can go right to the, the, the two sources. It's available on Verizon's website at www.verizonenterprise.com, uh, okay. or, or you can go directly to the Secret Service. To the Secret Service. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, it's on our webpage as well, www.secretservice.gov. They're able to get it there. Thank you very much. Brian just shared with us that threats are becoming ever more complex. And Ron, I'd love to turn to you now and say, how grave are the threats? Well, the threats we've seen are both still foreign and domestic. Uh, in past investigations, we've learned that, the, as the report stated, there are more threats over in Eastern Europe that were the financial attacks on our infrastructure, our financial system. But we also had the success of arresting some subjects in, a, in America that are also participating in that. Mm -hmm. What is the worst case scenario? Uh, the worst case scenario, that's kind of hard to describe. The, the individuals that we're investigating are very intelligent, uh, very driven. Uh, they, some of the actors that we've been interviewed have admitted to being online in excess of 10 hours a day, uh, making attempts to attack the financial infrastructure or the financial mm -hmm. banking systems. So they're smart, they're diligent, and they're nothing but bad intentions. Yes. Most unfortunately. And what about the study this year? Because the study this year has reflected the complexity and reflected that. Anything else of note that you've seen in there that you would say, Brian, is of note for our audience? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that uh, when it comes to good security, clearly there's no longer a one-size-fits-all approach. In years past, when there was only, for example, financial crimes, uh, then you could say, you know, based upon real science and the study of real cases, actual data breaches that have happened this year, we could say if you just do these five or six things, it will mitigate the risk of 78.233% of every actual data breach. And that's powerful knowledge for prevention. But right, yes. Very. Because of the variability that I mentioned in the threat landscape, the different kinds of criminal motivations that we face, it's no longer that simple. The, clearly, that one-size-fits-all approach is inefficient at best. Yeah, it's good. That's good. Those days are gone. Yeah, yeah we've are. moved move beyond that. Mm -hmm. And what would you you say, Ron, is what the, what the Secret Service should be doing and is doing? We are uh, aggressively uh, going after the cyber criminals, the more advanced cyber criminals, I think, personally. Uh, you know, looking for the guys that are actually doing the hacking into the financial systems, the guys that are 
running bulletproof host service uh, servers to protect them. Guys running uh, dump checking card checking systems to verify that the dumps that they've stolen are actually good and usable. Mm -hmm. So they're out there. Well, thank you for all that you're both doing. Thank you for helping to protect our nation. And thank you for coming in this morning and sharing with us. Absolutely. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. This morning I have with me Steve McBrady, who's of counsel at the law firm of Kroll & Morning. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Hillary. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome. And what's delightful about having Steve here this morning is there's so much pessimism in the marketplace, but Steve's, Steve brings a degree of optimism. Sequestration has brought around a lot of conversations about cutting, 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 but you have some other views. Well, I think there are two things to think about. First of all, sequestration, uh, it's here now. Uh, it's a reality for contractors throughout the marketplace. And uh, sequestration does mean cuts. And I think that we all have to accept that. But on the other hand, um, the federal marketplace is vast. The government buys $500 billion of products and services. It's the largest buyer in the world. So even cutting 5 to 10% of $500 or $600 billion still leaves a vast marketplace with a lot of opportunity for smart contractors. And there's going to be an avalanche of opportunities because the government has to procure and has been holding back, so there will be an avalanche at some juncture. I think that's right, and I think that smart contractors are, are ready to pounce on the opportunity as it has come out because there are facilities, there are uh, services that the contractors provide to the federal government that you know the government is not capable of operating many facilities without the help of contractors. As somebody's once said, from aircraft carriers to toilet rolls. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, but what about, speaking of um, aircraft carriers, and different, there are so many different industries, apart from healthcare, IT, and cybersecurity, which everybody talks about, any other industries we should look at? I think that um, when you talk about stepping back for a second, it's all about innovation. The government needs to innovate, needs to be able to provide services at a reduced cost. That's why people are talking about health IT. Uh, that's why people are talking about cybersecurity and data breach protection and I think a host of other IT related cloud services. I think those are all areas that people are looking at as growth areas because they're areas where the private marketplace really needs to provide expertise to the government. Super. Well, you're a great voice of optimism. We loved having you. So thank you so much, Steve, this morning from Crowell & Morin. Thanks for having me. We all owe Gigi Sharma of Symantec, Brian Sartin from Verizon, and Ronald Adams from the Secret Service a debt of gratitude for their tireless efforts on our behalf. Thank you once again for watching Government Contracting Weekly and making it a part of your week's learning experience. We'll see you again next Sunday. You've been watching Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored each week by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. For additional information, comments, questions, or suggestions, please write us at governmentcontractingweekly.com.